Welcome to Dan's On Fandoms. I'm Dan. It's official. Ahsoka Tano has arrived and I am so here for it. Chapter 13, titled The Jedi, was everything I could have asked for and more. I probably said oh my god about a hundred times during the episode because it was just awesome. There's a ton of things to discuss with this episode, so let's get right into it and talk about our top 8 baller moments from Chapter 13, The Jedi. Starting off at number 8, Ahsoka Tano, How I've Missed Thee. The episode begins on Corvus and I love the vibe of this planet. It's a dying world that almost looks as if the atmosphere is toxic. We'll learn later in the episode that the planet has been exploited and degraded to help build the Imperial fleet. I also enjoyed how the armed guards of Magistrate Morgan Elsbeth looked and sound with their masks. From there, my number one homegirl, Ahsoka Tano, appears and cuts down the armed guards like it's nothing. As was rumored, Rosario Dawson is the actress portraying Ahsoka, and I'm kinda glad Favreau and company decided not to use Ashley Eckstein's voice, which many Star Wars fans speculated might happen. First, seeing her run through the fog with the hilts we saw her wield in Rebels, appearing and disappearing almost like an apparition or ghost, and cutting down those guards was amazing. The moment her white lightsabers ignited, I could not contain my excitement and elation. That scene where she used the force to make a noise and then sliced the guard through the tree was so damn dope. If you've watched some of our other videos, you know that Ahsoka is one of my absolute favorite characters characters in all of Star Wars, so to see her in live action was so special and such a treat for me. It was extremely tough to contain my enjoyment while watching this scene. Second, Ahsoka's dealing in some absolutes in this episode which our boy Obi-Wan wouldn't have liked. When Ahsoka stands before the magistrate, she tells the villainous woman to surrender or face the consequences, giving her a day to decide. This wasn't the only moment in the episode where Ahsoka said or did something that I think the Jedi of old would not have approved of, which I actually love. Characters such as Ahsoka, Kanan Jarrus, Ezra Bridger, and even Luke show that the dogmatic approach of the Jedi of the prequel era was not the best way to go about doing things, and we know that Ahsoka's intentions are pure and good-hearted. So deal away with those absolutes, homegirl. As Ahsoka speaks to the Magistrate, we learn that the Magistrate has information Ahsoka wants, which we'll talk about more later in the video. We then come to our number 7 baller moment of the episode, Din and the Child head to Corvus. I enjoyed this scene a bunch because there are several takeaways that I got from it. We see the Razor Crest getting ready to enter Corvus' atmosphere, and Din tells the child to get in his seat. Initially, the child doesn't listen, as he wants the ball knob we saw him play with in Season 1, so Din has to tell him a little more sternly a second time, which gets the child to then listen. Once in his seat, however, he uses the force to unscrew and get the knob. They soon land on Corvus, and we get to see these dinosaur-looking creatures munching on the decayed wasteland of the planet. I know I've seen these dinosaur-looking creatures before, either in concept art or something, but I can't can't figure it out. If you know where they've appeared before, let me know down in the comments. Din and the child soon emerge from the Razor Crest and Din learns that the child disobeyed him and took that ball knob outside the crest, which Din has previously instructed him not to do. So couple of takeaways with this scene. As with other scenes this season, we see that the child absolutely understands what Din is telling him, so the child is clearly cognizant of what he's doing and twice he disobeys Din. Once when Din tells him to get in his seat and again when he brings the ball knob outside of the Razor Crest. I don't think it's a coincidence in the slightest that, in the first scene of Din and the child in this episode, the child is disobeying Din even if it seems like it's something that's not a big deal. A big motif of this series is the idea that the interactions and experiences that the child has with Din leave an imprint on him. Multiple times last season, that point was hammered home, especially in the scene where Quill explained to Din how he reprogrammed IG-11. Is the imprint that Din leaves on the child positive or negative? Will the child lean towards the light side or the dark side of the force. Moments such as the child disobeying Din or when he forced choke Cara Dune last season enforce that the child's time with Din has yielded some negative behaviors in our little green friend. That is something that I think will continue to be at the heart of this series and will be an underlying theme as the story progresses. It even comes up later in the episode once Din and Ahsoka come together. I really enjoyed how this scene conveyed that. That takes us then to our number 6 baller moment, Din meets the Magistrate. Din and the child head out for the city of
with Caladan in hopes of getting info on where to find Ahsoka, and the two soon arrive at the city gate. The captain of the guard, whose name is apparently Lang, lets Din enter the city, where he eventually comes across some townsfolk who he tries to get information from. Guards find Din and prepare to bring the Mandalorian before the magistrate. Yo, those town folk that were imprisoned in those electrocution poles totally reminded me of the slaves crucified in Marine in Game of Thrones. Frickin' brutal. Once inside the magistrate's tranquil garden, we see our guards are two HK-87 droids. HK series assassin droids first appeared in Legends in the classic 2003 RPG game Knights of the Old Republic with the hilarious droid HK-47. That's right, meatbags. The magistrate then enlists Din to hunt down and kill Ahsoka, telling Din she'll give him a pure Beskar spear as his payment for killing the former Jedi. Din begins to head into the wastelands in search of Ahsoka, bringing us to our number 5 baller moment, Din and Grogu meet Ahsoka. There is so damn much to dissect with this scene, so let's first start with the fact that Ahsoka appears and attacks Din, believing him to be an enemy, but Din is able to quickly de-escalate the situation, stating that Bo-Katan sent him. We now know that Beskar can in fact be used to defend against a lightsaber, which makes a ton of sense. Mandalorians and the Jedi were ancient enemies, so it would have behooved Mandalorians to make armor that's impenetrable to lightsabers. Also, right before Din encounters Ahsoka, we can see this convoy perched on a branch. Although we don't know if the convoy is Morai, I'm inclined to say it is. Morai is a convoy that has spiritual ties to the daughter, a force god of sorts that embodied the light side of the force. Morai appears throughout the Clone Wars and Rebels, and seems to act as a protector for Ahsoka, so I think it's safe to assume this convoy is in fact Morai, which is a great detail by Filoni. In the next scene, Ahsoka is with a child, while Din anxiously paces in the distance. Ahsoka soon tells Din that she and freaking Grogu were able to communicate with one another telepathically, feeling each other's thoughts through the Force. When Din says Grogu's name for the first time and Grogu looks up at Din and makes that adorable cooing sound, it was almost too much for me to handle. I loved it. Aside from us learning his name, which I like but will take some time getting used to, Ahsoka tells Din that Grogu was raised on Coruscant in the Grand Jedi Temple where he trained with many Jedi Masters. Ahsoka further explains that Grogu was hidden following the conclusion of the Clone Wars after someone took him from the Jedi Temple. Which, hmm, who was it that took Grogu from the Jedi Temple? Let me know your theories down in the comments. After that, Ahsoka explains that Grogu's memory is dark, and I love the use of that word. When she says dark, does she mean he can't remember what happened after leaving the Jedi Temple, or that his memories are literally dark, meaning some bad things happened? As mentioned earlier, Ahsoka's comment is not coincidental. Will Grogu sway towards the light side of the Force as he ages, or will his past and current experiences push him towards the dark side? When Ahsoka said that she's only known one other being of this species and mentioned Yoda, I felt all the feels guys, all the feels. Wanting to know if Grogu can still use his powers, Ahsoka states she'll test the young one the following day, taking us to our number 4 baller moment, Ahsoka tests Grogu's force abilities. I love the outfit Ahsoka is wearing which seems like a combination of what she wore in Rebels and the outfit she wore during the Siege of Mandalore in the Clone Wars. Initially, Ahsoka is unable to get Grogu to use the force, but Din is able to connect with the young one by using the knob from earlier, which Grogu happily uses the force to obtain from Din's hand. I adored how excited Din got when Grogu used the force to get the knob. At one point, Ahsoka also explains to Din that Grogu had hidden his abilities to survive over the years, which makes the moments when Grogu used the force to save Din in Season 1 even more meaningful. Grogu was clearly cognizant enough to know when and when not to use the force, and he chose to use the force several times in Season 1 to save Din's life, further cementing the bond between these two. Because of their bond, however, Ahsoka tells Din she can't train Grogu since she knows quite well what can happen to a fully trained Jedi Knight who fears losing those they're strongly attached to, referring to Anakin Skywalker and his fall to the dark side. Din then propositions Ahsoka, telling the former Jedi he'll help her fight the Magistrate if she promises to train Grogu. Din and Ahsoka begin to discuss their strategy and that's when Ahsoka informs Din that the Magistrate's name is Morgan Elsbeth. Ahsoka explains that, during the Clone Wars, Morgan Elsbeth's people were massacred and that she would later go on to become instrumental in the construction of the Imperial Navy during the reign of the Galactic Empire. Furthermore, Elsbeth plundered worlds to help fuel the Imperial military machine, destroying them in the process, which is what she appears to be doing on Corvus. Is she helping build the fleet for Moff Gideon, the First Order, or possibly a different character we'll get to shortly. We then arrive at our number 3 baller moment, Din and Ahsoka bring 
bring the fight to the magistrate. Ahsoka charges into Caladan, kicking ass and taking names along the way. Once inside the walls of the city, standing before Morgan Elsbeth and her goons, Ahsoka tosses one of Din's pauldrons to the ground, telling the magistrate she's killed her hired bounty hunter. Elsbeth orders her thugs to kill Ahsoka, but my homegirl force jumps to the roof of a building, deflecting blaster fire like it ain't no thing. Right as Elsbeth's guards are about to execute the individuals in those electrified poles, our boy Din appears and saves them. The moment when Ahsoka ignited her lightsabers as she stood behind the guards was so awesome. Total callback to her duel with Darth Vader in the season 2 finale of Rebels, which I loved. That then brings us to our number 2 baller moment, Ahsoka and Morgan Elsbeth go toe to toe. I totally got samurai movie vibes as the two enemies stand before each other about to face off in combat. Once they begin their duel, Elsbeth proves to be no slouch with her Beskar spear. For a moment, I irrationally feared for Ahsoka's life, especially when Ahsoka lost one of her lightsabers. While their duel roars on, Din and Lang speak to one another. Their standoff was tense as hell, especially when coupled with the noise of Ahsoka and Elsbeth's duel. Ahsoka is soon able to disarm Elsbeth, asking the magistrate where she can find her master, Grand Admiral Thrawn, which holy shiza balls. We even see the symbol of a chimera in the episode, which is the symbol used by Thrawn. As mentioned earlier, is she helping build a fleet for Thrawn? Could be dope as hell if she is. Before Elsbeth can answer, we come to our number one baller moment of the episode, Din and Grogu must head to Tython. After the dust has settled from the battle and the citizens of Caladan make that gentleman, whom Disney Plus referred to as a craggy-faced man, the magistrate, Ahsoka gives Din the Beskar spear. Din begrudgingly accepts it, which means our homeboy has leveled up again. Din then heads back to the Razor Crest to bring Grogu to Ahsoka for training, and my heart was melting as Grogu slept on the crest. Seeing Din wake Grogu and then hold the youngster brought all the feels. Din is clearly not thrilled about having to part ways with his young ward. Ahsoka then arrives and informs Din she can't uphold her end of the bargain since Din is like a father to Grogu. However, she instructs Din to travel to the planet of Tython, where the ancient ruins of a Jedi temple with a strong connection to the Force resides. In canon, Tython's only other mention came in the comic Dr. Aphra in issue 40, but will appear again in the upcoming High Republic comic series. In Legends, however, Tython was a very important planet, essentially serving as the birthplace of the Jedi Order, as well as their predecessors, the Jedi Order, so I appreciate that we're going to get to visit Tython in The Mandalorian. Ahsoka continues and tells Din to place Grogu on a seeing stone that sits atop a mountain, which will allow Grogu to choose his path, which I'm assuming is a similar sort of stone that we saw Luke use in The Last Jedi. If Grogu reaches out with the Force, Ahsoka explains, a Jedi may sense his presence and come searching for the youngling, even if there aren't many Jedi left. When the Razor Crest is lifting off and Ahsoka watches the ship with that orange glow illuminating her face, I couldn't help but be reminded of the scene in The Empire Strikes Back when Luke lifts off from Dagobah and Yoda speaks to Force Ghost Obi-Wan, concluding the episode. Guys, after watching that episode twice, I can safely say I loved everything about it. Ahsoka's appearance is most likely setting up the possibility of an Ahsoka series or a Rebel sequel series, which has been rumored for some time. Even if it's not, I'm just so happy we got to see Ahsoka appear in live action in The Mandalorian. Additionally, this episode sets the stage for Thrawn to appear in live action as well, which would be dope. Disney, hurry up and get Benedict Cumberbatch to agree to portray Thrawn. Fans of Rebels and both the Legends and Canon Thrawn book series are probably thrilled by this revelation. Din and Grogu heading to Tython also sets up the possibility of characters such as Luke, Leia, or Ezra possibly appearing in this series, which I'm ambivalent about. I'd rather Ezra appear over Luke and Leia, as I've had my fill of legacy characters at this point. Couple of other last takeaways, I love the Japanese aesthetic that was present throughout the episode, from the design of the buildings, the music, the gong that was used as an alarm, clothing worn by characters, as well as the HK assassin droid flipping onto that roof like a ninja in the episode's final act. It was a great touch considering Lone Wolf and the Cub was used, at least in part, as in inspiration for the story of this series, which is a manga about an assassin and his son. I also enjoyed Din referring to Ahsoka's lightsabers as laser swords, a reference to The Last Jedi and The Phantom Menace, and lastly, we also got a Lothcat appearance, which, hell yeah. 
All in all, this episode was so damn cool, and I can't wait for chapter 14 next week. But what do you guys think about chapter 13? How do you feel about Ahsoka's appearance? And do you like the name Grogu? Let us know down in the comments. Want more Star Wars content? Check out some of our other videos. Please like and subscribe, and stay nerdy.